Hello and welcome to another episode of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. I'm your host, Melissa Howes Whitecross, and I'd like to welcome all of our viewers tuning in through Zoom and Facebook Live this evening. If you would like to communicate with us, please use the Zoom chat room and remember to select all panelists and attendees if you want everyone listening to be able to see your message. Please ask your questions to the speaker by using the Q&A box throughout the webinar on Zoom. And if you're watching us on Facebook Live, you can use the comment feed for your comments and questions. Our speaker will answer these at the end of the webinar. Let us know that you are tuning in on all social media feeds by using the hashtag conservation conversations. If you've missed out on any of our previous webinars, you can catch up with these recordings on the BirdLife South Africa YouTube channel or listen via our new podcast available on all major podcast streaming services. We'd like to encourage all of you listening to please visit our YouTube channel and click the subscribe button on our channel to help us grow support for this webinar content. Now, a big thank you to those of you who continue to generously donate towards the production of these webinars using the Cricut Donations platform. All you have to do is scan the QR code or visit the Conservation Conversations website to find the link to the donations portal. Your contributions are helping us to keep these talks free for all to learn and enjoy. So a big thank you to those of you who continue to support us week in and week out. We are just two weeks away from BirdLife South Africa's Birding Big Day. Be sure to register your open or community teams on our website and email any queries to Ernst Retiff on bbd at birdlife.org.za. Birding Big Day is not just a competition, but a day where we celebrate the wonderful bird diversity we have in our beautiful country, South Africa. You can compete if you want to, but teams can also just spend a few hours in their local park or nature reserve, logging the birds that they encounter and enjoying being out in nature. And hopefully those of you based in Johannesburg after tonight's talk will be sure to go and visit some of the local parks that Caroline is gonna highlight this evening. As a collective, let's see how many of South Africa's birds we can log together. Last year, our total reached 667 bird species seen within South Africa in a 24 hour period. Let's see if we can crack that 700 mark in 2020. Be sure to play your part and join BirdLife South Africa and Bird Lasser in this year's Birding Big Day. Now we've partnered with Eco Training to bring our birders a very special opportunity as part, as, as part of the Birding Big Day celebrations later this month. We're offering a long weekend of birding in the magical Makuleki concession in the north of Kruger National Park from 26 to 29 November for just 5,400 Rand per person sharing. Spaces are limited, so make sure to book soon by emailing inquiries at ecotraining.co.za. And if you have any further questions, you can also give a shout out to our AV Tourism project manager and co-host of Conservation Conversations, Andrew DeBlanc. BirdLife South Africa is a membership-based organization and we pride ourselves on the over 40 affiliated bird clubs that support us across the country. If you're looking to expand your birding horizons or just wanting to find some new fellow birders to explore the fascinating world of birds with, we recommend visiting BirdLife South Africa's website and clicking the Support Us tab where you'll find the link to join a bird club. Find a suitable club near you and enjoy all of the exciting social activities that are on offer from our clubs. Our final Jakarta Media Monthly giveaway for November promises this month's winner an amazing collection of bird-related titles. You can enter the competition by visiting the Conservation Conversations website and clicking the competition link. Unfortunately, this is only open to South African-based viewers, but we'd like to say a big thank you to Jakarta Media for supporting our webinars this year and partnering with us to bring our viewers an amazing selection of prizes. And that's not the only competition running, Tonight, one lucky viewer will walk away with the final Zeiss Hygiene Hamper giveaway. And all you have to do is stay tuned to the end of the question session this evening to stand a chance of winning. This great prize will help our winner and their loved ones stay safe and sanitized during these uncertain times. So be sure to stand your chance of winning by sticking around tonight. Now tonight, I am excited to welcome Dr. Caroline Howes to your screens. And yes, it is no coincidence that we share part of a surname. Caroline was born in the state of Maine in the far northeast of the United States and held a deep-seated passion for birds and nature throughout her childhood. She volunteered with her local Audubon Society and spent time assisting on piping plover research projects before heading south to complete her BSc at Duke University 
majoring in biology. While attending a varsity study abroad, abroad program in her sophomore year, Caroline came to South Africa to participate in the Organization for Tropical Studies, also known as OTS course, during the latter part of 2011, and spent the next 100 days exploring Kruger National Park and the West Coast, learning about the incredible ecology and biodiversity on offer in South Africa. She fell instantly in love with this country, and incidentally, both myself and Dr. Siobhan Reynolds, who is Caroline's postdoc host, happened to be part of that same OTS course, and being three of the only bird nerds on the course, we all headed off immediately. Caroline completed her BSc at Duke and then rapidly relocated back to South Africa in 2013, where she began a master's looking at the risks of power line collisions on vultures across South Africa. She completed this MSc with distinction and went on to become South Africa's leading European honey buzzard expert, completing her PhD on the species in 2019 at Wits University. If you've not yet heard Caroline speak about her honey buzzard research, I strongly suggest you try and attend her next talk on this subject. Besides being an incredibly talented ornithologist, Caroline is a fantastic birder and arguably, arguably one of the top young female birders in South Africa, having seen 600, 764 different species in the subregion since moving to South Africa. She's also an enthusiastic bird ringer and is currently training with the Wits Bird Club, and tonight, Caroline will be sharing some of her latest research from her current postdoctoral fellowship, which she is doing under the guidance of Dr. Siobhan Reynolds at Wits University. I'm sure that all of you will enjoy Caroline's passion and insights into the birds of Johannesburg's urban green spaces. And I'd like to say a big thank you to Caroline for coming on to Conservation Conversations. Kaz, I'm going to hand over to you. Thanks so much for joining us and enjoy your talk. Let's just make sure that we've got this set up for you properly. Give us one second. There we go. Enjoy, everybody. Hello, all, and thank you, Melissa, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I think that pretty much sums up my background and how I, how I got here. Um, and what I'm talking about today is, or tonight, I guess, is my work in the city of Johannesburg looking at birds and how birds can represent biodiversity access across such a diverse city. So Melissa summed this up pretty nicely, but I have been a crazy birder from the time I was very small. My first Halloween costume was a black capped chickadee, my, state's, uh, my state bird. Um, I went on to be a peacock and won third prize in the Halloween contest uh, in about grade five. And since then, I have I, I have always loved birds and worked with birds um, yeah, throughout my academic career. And this particular work that I've worked that I'm currently doing is really about urbanization and why we should care about urbanization is that we are seeing a huge population shift from rural to urban areas. So increasingly, there's a decreasing proportion of the human population in rural areas and a greater proportion in the more urban areas. This really began in the late 1700s in the Western world, um, but since the 1950s has really taken off in the developing world as well. Um, and 2007 was a particularly important turning point when for the first time in our planet's history, there are more urban, urban dwellers than rural, than rural people. Um, as of 2018, we now have over 550 cities in the world with over a million habitats, including 63 on the African continent. And all of this really comes down to people moving towards economic activities. So globally, you can see on the left-hand side, here's a map showing the urbanization of the proportion of people living in an urban in an urban center um, over the past few decades. Um, so there it's starting again. You can see it's getting darker and darker across the globe, uh, starting in the more developed world uh, northern hemisphere areas, but increasingly spreading through Asia, Africa, and South America. Um, and by 2050, two thirds of developing world citizens will be urban. So that's a total of about 5.26 billion people. Um, and this is why we really need to study and understand the urban environment. 
So in terms of what an urban environment really means in terms of our sort of landscape and ecology and uh, how it affects biodiversity in general is urbanization causes significant environmental changes. Um, any of us who live in a major city know this. Um, and a lot of these effects are, are sort of unspoken in a way, but obviously we get a, a lot more increase, a lot more paved areas um, across the city. Um, there's this idea of the urban heat island effect where our cities tend to be hotter than the surrounding areas. They tend to hold on to heat. Uh, we have huge modification of waterways, um, paving and storm drain systems, etc. cetera. Um, air pollution is often increased. We create a lot of habitat for invasive species. And all of this has a clear effect on biodiversity, although it's not always the way that we would necessarily expect it to affect biodiversity. But with all this change, is there another more sustainable way to start thinking about this? And the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are a call to action from all the UN countries um, that are looking to promote prosperity and protect the planet. And one of these 17 goals is number 11, which is the idea of sustainable cities and communities. And this includes a whole bunch of provisions um, to improve the lives of people and improve the, the sustainability of our, of our lifestyles um, in these cities. So some of these provisions include strengthening efforts to protect the world's natural heritage. So this means really trying to conserve the biodiversity in these systems. Um, also to reduce the adverse per capita impacts of cities. So uh, people in cities tend to use a lot more resources than those in more rural areas. Um, and we really need to start thinking about this as the majority of our population is now within these spaces. And then the part that I'm really interested in, which is to provide safe and inclusive ex and accessible green and public spaces. So this means accessible and inclusive to all sects of the population, uh, regardless of what country you live in, etc. cetera. Um, and green, urban green spaces are, are a really important part of this. So an urban green space is really anything green within an urban matrix, anything vegetated. So this is everything from your own backyard to a golf course, to nature reserves, to even just the jacarandas down the side of, of a lot of our roads here in Johannesburg. And this can also include, you know, more natural spaces. So urban nature reserves, somewhere like Klipperfersberg would be an example in, in Johannesburg or Table Mountain in, in Cape Town to sort of more manicured spaces. So things like Delta Park or, um, or yeah, more, more lawn-like traditional parks. And urban green spaces are extremely, extremely important for, for human beings and for, for urban dwellers. So they do all sorts, of, all sorts of things for us. So they provide great recreational spaces. So think things like park run or going to have a picnic or going birding. Um, they conserve a lot of natural resources as well. Um, particularly in systems that are really rapidly changing. Um, they're, of course, aesthetically appealing. We like being in parks. Uh, humans like green spaces in most cases. Um, they're also associated with reducing disease rates. So this is partly due to having access to a place to exercise safely or um, you know, to go for a walk, to do your yoga, to go for a run. And they also improve our mental health. So having a calming green space is, is really important. And this is really especially important for sort of vulnerable populations, meaning you know, those who maybe don't have a big backyard to be able to, to uh, spend time in. Um, and the public green spaces are really important to, to, help, uh, to help with all of these effects. But sadly, we know that not all green spaces are created equally so or are spread equally. So we know that people in poorer neighborhoods tend to live further from green spaces, tend to have smaller green spaces within their neighborhoods. 
and the quality of the green space is also reduced. So what that means is the maintenance tends to be poorer and the features, things like fountains or trails or playgrounds, et cetera, tend to be reduced. So we know that there is, there is uh, unequal access to these spaces. And the aspect of this that I'm particularly interested in is this idea of the luxury effect. So this is a relationship between the wealth of a neighborhood and the biodiversity that's present. So this was first documented by Hope uh, in 2003 in the city of Phoenix in the United States, looking at plant diversity. And what they found was that wealthier neighborhoods had a higher diversity of plants. So this has since been shown in many other taxa, including uh, birds and reptiles, uh, butterflies as well. And essentially the diversity of plants and animals tends to be greatest in, in high income neighborhoods. And how this actually works is it's not a, a direct effect. So essentially when there's wealth in a neighborhood, people tend to invest more in a lot of things in that neighborhood. Um, this includes planting more trees, bushes, flowers, etc. cetera. Um, also, it, wealthier neighborhoods tend to have better access to water resources. Um, so this not only allows for watering of vegetation, but also is more likely to have uh, wetlands, rivers, ponds, etc., which also attract biodiversity. So in turn, all this extra tree cover and green space and uh, water attracts a whole host of birds, um, butterflies, plants, etc. cetera. Um, so it isn't this direct effect of the income that birds are somehow attracted to wealthier neighborhoods. It's, it's this middle effect that's really important. And we know that this luxury effect exists in South Africa, where I work. Um, so we know that, for instance, that there is less tree cover. So there, there, there's, um, yeah, in poorer neighborhoods in urban South Africa, and also that there's reduced green space access. And we also know that in the city of Cape Town that this applies to plant species as well. So there's fewer plant species in poor neighborhoods in the city of Cape Town as well. But in terms of birds, um, we've looked, it's really only been looked at uh, at a larger scale than, than this current study. Um, so this was a paper that my host worked on um, and it really started to test whether this luxury effect actually applied to bird species richness in the developing world. Um, and it used our beloved SABAP data um, to look at cities of greater than 250,000 inhabitants and looking at sort of more urban, uh, suburban and peri-urban sites in these, in these urban centers. And then looking at what what was driving what was driving that bird richness or or what was predicting that bird richness and what they actually found was that it was not income that had a direct effect on bird richness or urban cover which had a direct effect on richness but it was actually this really interesting complex relationship between the two so this graph, of course, looks very intimidating um, because it has three uh, sort of three things going on. But essentially, the, the line between A and B is the percent urban cover of a pentad. Um, so with low, with low urban cover towards A and high urban cover towards B. And median income is on that other axis between B and D with low income at D and high income at B. And then species richness is up that side. So basically what the idea is, is that if we look at where that first X is, that is the highest species richness. And what that is, is it is in high income, low urbanization, low urban cover areas. So this would be your typical leafy green southern suburbs of Cape Town or, or uh, northern suburbs of Johannesburg in general. Um, so this is followed by 
the, the second highest diversity is actually high urban cover, low income areas. So this would be sort of more informal settlement type habitat, uh, followed by rural, uh, rural, uh, rural low income areas. And then the lowest diversity is actually in these high income um, high urban cover areas. And these are essentially these very sterile central city areas, places like Rosebank or Santon um, in Johannesburg. So this relationship can be much more complex than just, just income and, and bird species richness. And just to make it even more complex, it obviously is not just, just this idea of the luxury effect that predicts bird diversity. So um, to show you exactly what I mean by this, I, I took a um, map of Portland, Maine, which is very near where I grew up uh, in the northeast of the US, and I have put two X's on the map in two different types of habitats. So the yellow one on the left, you can see is this more suburban green area, and the one on the right, this orange one, is more of a, of a city center. Um, and if we look at each predictor, we can make a guess about where higher bird diversity would be likely to be. So, for instance, in the case of tree cover, tree cover generally tends to increase bird diversity, um, which means that at the yellow X, where there's that nice leafy green area, we're likely to have higher bird diversity in that neighborhood. On the other hand, urban, urban land cover um, is higher at the orange X, which likely means lower bird diversity in that neighborhood. Uh, natural land cover surrounding these areas also tends to increase bird diversity. So the yellow X wins on that one again. You can see that nice big marsh to the, to the left of that. And uh, presence of water as well. Um, so once again, the yellow X wins there um, with Capsic Pond right there and being relatively close to, uh, to that freshwater uh, marsh there. So overall, we'd predict based on based on what we know um, about urban urban biodiversity that we would get higher diversity at that yellow X than the orange one. However, this is based on knowledge solely or mostly of from the northern hemisphere, um, from northern hemisphere developed countries. So in this particular review paper, they looked at 147 different um, different studies looking at urban biodiversity and drivers of urban biodiversity, and only five of them are from Africa um, and very few from the Southern Hemisphere. So this is clearly a gap. Um, the developing world is where the majority of population, um, population, urban population growth is going to occur, and yet we know very little about how it is going to affect biodiversity. So our, our system that we're working in for those international listeners um, is in South Africa, right uh, at the southern tip of the continent. And if we zoom in there, the city of Johannesburg is this uh, central, is in this sort of central South African um, plateau, essentially. Um, it's quite an interesting city. It's located at about 1,700 meters elevation or 5,700 feet, so it's quite a high elevation city. And it's a really interesting city as it's a patchwork of sort of natural grasslands and man-made forests. Um, so quite, quite amazing. Um, it also is the biggest city in South Africa um, with, with about 4.4 million inhabitants in the municipality itself. And how does Johannesburg differ from these sort of systems that have been previously studied? So first of all, because Johannesburg is in the subtropics, the bird diversity here is very high in comparison with a lot of the Northern Hemisphere cities. Um, we have an immense, an absolutely immense number of species, something like almost 50% of South Africa's um, bird species have been recorded here. Um, additionally, we have a much longer socioeconomic gradient than most northern hemisphere cities. So what that means is we have everything from very, very poor informal settlements to extremely wealthy, um, extremely wealthy northern suburbs. Um, you know, Johannesburg has more millionaires than any other city in 
in Africa, actually. Um, also, Johannesburg is a bit of a funny city. It's the second largest city in the world that's not located on a major river, lake, or sea. So water access is obviously something that we are perpetually at least mildly concerned about. And then lastly, uh, most northern hemisphere cities are, are forested, um, most of Europe and, and a lot of the United States, or were previously forested, whereas Johannesburg was a, originally a, a low tree cover or, or a grassland kind of biome. So the city is extremely different from, from a northern hemisphere um, city, and this makes it sort of a perfect laboratory to examine how these northern hemisphere trends actually hold up in, in an environment like this. So what we were really curious to do was, first of all, to establish if there is a luxury effect on bird diversity in Johannesburg's green spaces. So does income explain bird diversity in our parks? So we looked at income and urbanization in that case. And the second part was to determine if there's other landscape predictors that sort of challenge the idea of this luxury effect. Um, so this is things like park size, surrounding tree cover, uh, surrounding natural cover, or wetland connectivity. So how did we actually go about this? So first of all, we needed to pick a whole bunch of green spaces in the city of Joburg. Um, I will show you sort of how we did that in a minute. Um, but we tried to choose a huge variety of sizes, locations, types of parks um, to try to really capture the diversity of this city. From there, we went to go count, um, count our birds in these green spaces. Um, so this was quite the process. Um, I'll talk more about it in a minute. And then the last step was to use models, which is as far as I'm going to go into the statistics of this, um, to look at which factors were best predicting green space for diversity. So um, this included extracting a lot of variables around green spaces. Um, we used this two and a half kilometer buffer around these green spaces um, because it, it, it felt like a good a good distance that people would come to visit the park, as well as how much space a, a very mobile, mobile creature like a bird would be likely to use. So Johannesburg actually has a pretty incredible network of green spaces, as you can see on this map. All that bright green is owned by, owned and managed by Johannesburg City Parks, and they own just an absolutely huge proportion of the land in, in the city. So 5% of the total, total area of the municipality is actually owned by the by city parks. And this ranges from, you know, completely undeveloped felt, so just open land, to very small urban parks, to enormous nature reserves like Clipper Fearsburg, which is about 700 hectares. So, um, so we had to sort of think about which parks we were going to choose and, and why we were going to choose this. So Johannesburg City Parks owns about 2,500 parcels of land. Um, so we started out with about 2,500 options, which, which seemed quite overwhelming. But we could rapidly narrow that down because we really wanted to look at sort of larger green spaces. We wanted to be able to have multiple sampling points, and so it needed to be a certain size. So that automatically narrowed it down to, to over 150, to only 150 parks. From there, we really wanted to look at a set of natural, more natural parks. So these are bird sanctuaries or nature reserves, and then a, a set of more developed parks or manicured parks. Um, so those are, those are things like Delta, or um, these are pictures of Pioneer Park and in Innisfree near Santon. Um, and we didn't want these to be within another park or connected to another park. So that was um, eliminated another bunch. And then we chose a whole range of the surrounding urban cover. Um, so in that two and a half kilometer radius around these parks. So to try to capture the diversity of the landscapes within the city. So some parks had over 50% um, surrounding, surrounding urban cover and some had under 25%. Um, so there was a, a big diversity. And this is what our final uh, final set of parks actually looks like. 
So the green sites are our natural greens, more natural green spaces, and the yellow sites are the more manicured green spaces. So to give some context of what the city actually looks like, this is the Johannesburg uh, CBD or Central Business District, the real heart of the city. And um, you can see all those gold mine dumps underneath it. Um, down to the southwest is Soweto. Uh, out to the west is Rotoput there. Um, up north of the, of the city center is Alexandra, um, one of the biggest informal settlements. And then to the far north, we've got Midrand, uh, which is a lot of, a lot of uh, housing developments. So once we had all these parks, um, all 20, 29 of them originally, we narrowed it down to 27 after we started analysis. We went and we did a whole bunch of point counts. So every park had two to four sites, every green space, and we tried to choose a whole bunch of different habitats within this green space, near water, far from water, more trees, less trees. And then we would go to each site and sample it three times across the across the austral summer. So uh, between November and uh, February here. And we did five minute point counts. So what a what a point count is, is we would walk, we would stand at our point and we would count everything that we saw or heard within within a sort of 50 meter radius. Um, so this, we'd also do a little bit of flushing just to get any sort of cryptic species out of the grass. Um, and yeah, so this gives us an idea of how many birds and what species are where. So we did a total of 261 of these point counts, which equals about 22 hours in total of, of point counting. Um, so we counted a lot of birds. Um, we counted almost 7,000 individuals and we got 149 species within these point counts, which is pretty spectacular, spectacular diversity for, for an urban center like this. Our most common species, for any of you from Joburg, you could probably predict this. Um, so our most common species, we started with, of course, our dear friend, the Southern Mast Weaver. Um, he was on 75% of all counts that we completed, and we counted about 800 individuals, which is just, you know, over 10% of what we counted were, were Southern Mast Weavers. Um, these guys are abundant and love our green spaces. Uh, this was followed by our friend, the dark cat Bulbul, which is on 66% of counts. Uh, our very noisy friend, the tawny flanked Prinia, which was on just over half of our counts. Uh, many, many people's enemy, the, the common mina, uh, an exotic species, that uh, was on 45%. And then number five was the African palm swift, which is a really spectacular urban adapter who has um, really taken advantage of all the of all the palm plantings that we we as humans have brought to Johannesburg. So those are the common species, but what else can we find in some of these parks? Um, I'm going to just go through a few of my favorites, some of the ones that I think have particularly interesting species. Um, so I'm going to start with this one up here. This is called Glen Austin Bird Sanctuary um, up in Midrand, right on the border of Johannesburg municipality. Um, and this is sort of what it looks like. So here's a satellite image um, from Google Maps. And we can see the green boundary of the park. Um, and then little yellow dots are where we sampled. And you can see the diversity of the urban landscape surrounding this. So we can see that to the southeast is the informal settlement of Tembisa. Uh, we get a lot of plots to the west. Um, and then to the northeast is uh, some remaining relatively natural grassland. Um, so this little, this little pan is quite small. Um, it's only 12 hectares um, and it's got quite a low proportion of surrounding urban cover, only 17%. And it's in an area, it's in one of the, one of the poorer areas that we sampled. So the, the median household income so how much how much money one household makes over the course of a year um, or sort of the average of it, it was only about 28,000 28, rand um, per year. 
And the diversity here is pretty amazing. So we got 42 total species um, across the nine point counts, and there was an average of about 12 per count, um, 12 species per count. Uh, this is what it actually looks like. It is a really spectacularly beautiful pan, um, lots of African bullfrogs, um, and some really interesting and beautiful species of birds. So we got things like white-faced whistling duck, um, quite a handsome, handsome little wetland bird. We also got our friend the fulvis whistling duck, um, the absolutely beautiful Cape shoveler, um, and we also got Makoa duck, which is a near-threatened species globally, and spur-winged goose on top of that in terms of ducks. Uh, we got one of Melissa's favorites here, the gray-headed gull, lots of them knocking around this pan. And then in addition to all these wetland species, we also got a lot of sort of grassland type species. So things like uh, Cape Longclaw. Um, we had a lot of zitting cysticolas there calling as well. Um, and northern black coron sort of further afield. So quite an interesting diversity of species and very a lot of habitat specific type birds. Um, the other sort of natural site that I thought was pretty pretty interesting is Harvey Linksfield Nature Reserve. Um, this is also in the east of the municipality. Um, you could see it's this natural ridge um, that sort of cuts through the suburbs of Bedford View, Morning Hill, uh, Bruma, and it's it's a really interesting it's a really interesting place. Um, it's primarily surrounded by these uh, quite lush suburbs, um, as well as a couple golf courses, not much water in the area. Um, and it's it's quite a big reserve. So it's about 51 hectares on the Johannesburg side, but it actually extends probably equally as far into Ekeleni, the neighboring municipality. Um, it has a lot more urban cover surrounding it than Glen Austin, so about 25%. Um, and it's in a much, much wealthier neighborhood. So. A uh, median income of, of around 100,000 rand per household per year. Um, but despite this, it has much lower. It has a much lower total number of species, um, only 35, and we got about nine species per count there. Um, it is a truly spectacular, spectacular place. Beautiful views across the city of Johannesburg, um, but. The really cool part for me as a birder is because it's a ridge, it supports some really unique species that are specifically adapted to this sort of habitat. Uh, so we got, got uh, little guys like whaling cysticola, uh, which really loves sort of rocky ridges, uh, as well as his cousin, the netiki. Um, lots of cinnamon breasted buntings in terms of little, little passerines as well. Uh, we also got this, this ridgy specialist, the striped pipit. Um, which is quite a beautiful, quite a beautiful species, quite uncommon, uh, quite uncommon in the eastern half. We also had at least two adult lanner falcons and one juvenile lanner falcon knocking around this area, which was quite, quite amazing, um, quite cool to see to see a raptor like that in the city itself. And then some really spectacular uh, ground birds. So we flushed a common button quail one morning. Uh, Melissa was actually with me on that one, uh, which we really thought was pretty amazing. And beyond that, the one that's really blew me away was we had a, a bronze-winged courser, actually, that we flushed on our on our walk back from point counts the one morning. So this ridge, this, this large natural patch, actually supports some really unique and really amazing species. So those are natural sites, and we would sort of expect, um, we, we have this idea that they would support these types of species, but what about our more developed or manicured parks? So this is one of my other favorites, uh, Golden Harvest in the northern suburbs. Uh, I know Vitz Bird Club leads outings here, um, and you should definitely go for it. It's quite a, quite a cool place to go. Um, and it's surrounded by mostly suburbs, as well as a few industrial areas. Um, it's a very large park, about 100, over 100 hectares, um, and surrounded by very little natural area. Um, it's even wealthier than um, than Linksfield with about 200,000 200, rand, and it has a super high species diversity, so 62 species. Um, and the reason I think 
it, you know, this has a lot to do with sort of the types of habitats that are there. So things like dams, uh, wetlands, there's quite a lot of gum trees, there's beautiful sort of ridgy bush, and then also open grassy areas. So some of the cooler species we got there, we had giant and pied kingfishers, we had Birchell's kukuls, uh, several brown-backed honeybirds, which are quite nifty little <laughs> LBJs, and even, even orange-breasted waxbills, um, as well as some cool sightings of black sparrow hawks that seem to be breeding in the gums, and a whole flock of arrow-marked babblers, which uh, was quite a cool one. Um, this is in contrast with, um, so that's a very wealthy and very large park. Um, this is in contrast with an area um, of uh, another park called River Park, um, which is in a much less wealthy area and is a much smaller park um, on the boundary between Alexandra and Lombardy East. Um, so it's surrounded by majority informal settlements, a few suburbs and a lot of industria. Um, it's very small, um, only less, uh, less than 10 hectares and very, very urban around it um, and with a very low median income, uh, similar to Glen Austin. But despite this, the diversity is still fairly decent. It's still higher than, um, still, still pretty decent. Um, 36 species um, and almost as many species per point count as golden harvest. So even though there was less sort of uh, less diversity between point counts, each point count was still close to as diverse. Um, and some of the, you know, this is what it looks like. It's really just a little strip of sprite um, between Lombardy East and, and Alex. And some of the cool species we got there is we got our dear friend, the African black duck. Anywhere there's a sprite, he, he will likely be. Uh, tons and tons of brown-throated martins nesting in the banks of the river. And also the only house sparrow we got on any point counts across the entire study, um, which is quite interesting. So I guess then the question is sort of where is the diversity in Johannesburg? So just to give some ideas, we know that the lowest number of species was at the wilds with only 26. The highest was at Golden Harvest, which had more than twice as many species than the wilds with 62. And then in terms of what we were really interested in, which was the number of species per a point count, um, once again, the wilds was very low diversity as well as Remsuch butterfly out in the butterfly reserve out in the west with only about eight species per point count in contrast with the highest species per point count, which had about 15 species, which is pretty spectacular um, for a five minute count. So how does this now connect back to income though? We've sort of talked a little bit about where the richness and diversity might be, but where, where, is, where are the wealthier areas and where are the less wealthy areas? So um, to give a sense, these blue parks, these six blue parks are the six, are the parks with the wealthiest surrounds. So this is Ramsuch Butterfly, Cumberland Nature Reserve, Witkopen Park, Edison Crescent, Blue Bird Sanctuary, and Richfontein Nature Reserve. And the median income surrounding per household per year in the surrounding areas for these parks is over 460,000 Rand per year. So quite wealthy, um, definitely in the upper 1% of South Africa. And the orange are the parks in the poorest areas. So Glen Austin Pan, Innisfree Park and River Park out by Alex and Santon. Uh, Jorothy Nyembe, Mofolo, and Tokoza in, in Soweto. And the median income in these parks per household, or surrounding these parks per household per year, was only 29,000 rand. So in the wealthiest areas, we're talking about 1 16th as much income in, in, these, in these areas. Um, so there's a huge diversity of incomes across our sampling. But when we actually start to look at this on a graph and how it affects sort of our point count or how many birds we got on each point count, um, we can see that it gets a little more complicated. So the top graph is bird species richness. So it has the lowest richness uh, per point count. 
is on the left-hand side and the highest is on the right-hand side. So the lowest diversity per point count was of course Remsuch and the Wilds and the highest is Witkofen. Um, and if we actually highlight the blue wealthy parks on, these, on this, we can see that these wealthy parks do not have consistently high diversity um, and are actually spread across. So there's half that are in sort of the top 50% in terms of, of number of bird species and half that are in the bottom. And this is sort of interesting because it's in contrast to the, the poorer parks in, or the parks in the poorest areas, um, which are all actually in the top half of uh, top 50% in terms of number of species. So what's actually going on here? Um, and is there, is there any evidence for the luxury effect in, in our data? So as I, as I mentioned before, the first, uh, the first sort of question was, does, income, does the income of the green spaces surrounding area affect bird diversity and richness? And what about surrounding urbanization as well? So we tested whether income affected the number of species we got per point count, whether urbanization affected it, and whether there was that interaction that I talked about earlier from previous studies. And what we found was that there was no effect of income on richness in these parks, no effect of urbanization, and no effect of the interaction between. So there was, yeah, so there was really no evidence for the luxury effect. But if not the luxury effect, then what? So are there more ecological factors that are going to affect bird diversity? So when we looked at our models, we checked park size, we set, checked tree cover in the surrounding area, we checked natural land in the surrounding area, and wetland connectivity through these parks and into their surroundings. And we found no effects in terms of park size, so bigger parks did not have more species uh, per point count. Tree cover had no effect. And interestingly, surrounding natural land cover had a negative effect. So what that means is more surrounding, more natural land surrounding these parks meant a reduced number of species per point count. This is the opposite of wetland connectivity, which had a positive effect um, on bird richness. So what that means is that if there was greater wetland connectivity, so more um, connected wetlands, a better network of wetlands surrounding these parks, then the number of species on our point counts increased. So I guess the first question we had when we looked at this was why in the world would natural land cover have a negative effect? We really have this idea that, you know, natural land, natural habitats means more, more diversity, more birds, et cetera. And essentially we have two ideas about why, why this would be the case. Um, the first is that there's really low overall bird diversity in these high felt Johannesburg grasslands. So the natural la grassland, the natural landscapes in these cities, in the city are not necessarily particularly bird diverse. Um, and therefore they might not really contribute that much diversity into these park systems. Um, additionally, the type of species that are found in these grasslands are maybe unlikely to be the types of species that we would expect to, to colonize these parks. So you know, many of them may be grassland specialists who are not going to be keen on moving into a developed park. Um, but then the bigger one and is this idea that a mix of habitats generally has higher bird diversity than one single type of habitat. So as we get more and more natural cover, that means less and less of other, other types of habitats. So this is an idea of habitat heterogeneity or a mix of habitats. And what this actually means and why this sort of works this way in, in a very simplified idea is that if we have this lovely high felt grassland habitat, we might have a few species that really like that habitat. So things like pied starlings, swains and spur fowl, cinnamon breasted bunting likes the ridges in these grasslands. And then on the other hand, if we have this urban forest that, that covers a lot of Johannesburg, 
you know, we have a whole nother set of species that may like that habitat. So this is things like black collared barbets, uh, cardinal woodpecker, and, and green wood hoopoe. But so each of these habitats might support a nice suite of species, but if we have a nice mix, then we might get both suites of species and we get this lovely high diversity with this, with this mix of habitats. So besides the question of why natural land cover is negative, there is now, of course, this question of why is there not a luxury effect in a city like Johannesburg? Um, and sort of our, our theory as to this is that there are two main ecological associations with the luxury effect. Um, and one of these is sort of vegetation or tree cover. And the other is, is water, is access to water and water availability. So tree cover did not affect bird diversity in Johannesburg green spaces in our study. And so that sort of association was kind of out. Uh, that explanation doesn't really make sense because if tree cover is not increasing diversity, then increasing tree cover in wealthier neighborhoods is not going to, going to explain our luxury effect. However, we do know that wetlands have a very strong positive association with, with increasing numbers of birds. So um, there's a very so there's a very strong strong association between birds and wetlands, or number of species in wetlands. And in Johannesburg, there's also this really interesting relationship between urban cover and wetlands. So in more urban areas, we seem to get a greater, a greater wetland connectivity and more and more overall wetland cover. Um, so what that actually looks like is um, this is Soweto. Um, it is in the southwest of Johannesburg and it is very densely urban. Um, and despite this extremely dense urban cover, you can also see these big green swaths running through this um, this this uh, space. So. And what those are, are absolutely massive wetlands um, running through, running through the, the area. Um, and these wetlands and the influence of these wetlands is reflected in the bird richness of the green spaces in this area. So all three of these Sueto parks were in the top quarter um, of, our, of our parks in terms of richness on point counts. So, uh, Mofolo had the second greatest second greatest number of species uh, per point count. Uh, Dorothy Niembe had the fifth greatest, and Tokoza had the seventh greatest um, in terms of species richness. So you can see that um, despite this not being a particularly wealthy area, um, it, there's not low there there's not low bird richness. So what the idea of this sort of is, is that in Johannesburg, poor, very urbanized areas are often associated with wetlands. Um, and what this comes down to is historic sort of urban, urban planning or uh, decisions. Um, so many, many marginalized communities were separated from the rest of the city using water bodies um, from the very time the city began to through the apartheid era. And so many of these neighborhoods are now very strongly associated with these massive wetlands. But what's also happening is that these wetlands are buffering poorer neighborhoods from low bird richness. So they're adding a huge amount of bird diversity to these, to these uh, green spaces in poorer neighborhoods and protecting these neighborhoods from the expected luxury effect um, with the expected sort of reduced number of species. Which is, you know, pretty, pretty good news. So what this all means is that bird diversity in parks in Johannesburg is not associated with the wealth of the neighborhood. Um, and this this is really good news. It means that if you have access to a park, regardless of your income, you have an equal chance of, of having a good, uh, a good, a good amount of, of at least bird diversity and perhaps other biodiversity as well. However, we also need to remember that it's a little bit more complicated than that. 
So despite the fact that bird uh, diversity might be equal within these parks or green spaces, access to green spaces is not equal still. We still need to address massive disparities in terms of how um, poor, in terms of making sure that there is green space access in poorer areas. And additionally, there are other barriers besides just access. Um, we know that issues such as safety, um, particularly in, in our green spaces here in Johannesburg, um, safety is a huge problem for a lot of people, um, regardless of where you live. Um, and also just having leisure time um, and actually having the time to go to these spaces and experience the diversity that is there. So in terms of sort of in the long term, what what's the what city parks really, really must think about is how we can improve access to green spaces across the city um, in order to provide biodiversity for for all of our all of the city's citizens. So that's sort of our story. Um, I just want to say a special thanks to all of the people who have helped me with this helped us with this research. Um, of course, Johannesburg City Parks for providing a lot of data, um, the custodians of a lot of these parks that are private access and rather difficult to get into. Um, massive thanks to the Witt School of Governance for funding me. And of course, my absolutely fabulous field assistants, um, Janiel, Matt, Camden, and Mahir, who helped me through all of this field work. Thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Caroline. My word, it is so cool to be able to see just what all those early 4 a.m. mornings were all about. And uh, really wonderful, and congrats to you on, on such an absolutely incredible study. I'm, I'm quite blown away by all of that. I'm just trying to get our closing slides up and running here while I say thank you to you. So give us a second, everybody, while we juggle these technical challenges with uh, not having two different screens. But um, yeah, Kaz, wow, I, I'm so amazed. And I really, I, I don't think everybody realizes when you set out to do science, you spend many, many hours out there in the world trying to collect all this data at 4 a.m. in these dodgy Johannesburg parks. And a big thank you from my side to all of your field assistants who went out there to help you. Um, and you, you end up with a great story like this at the end of the day. So a big well done to you. And um, thank you so much for coming on to Conservation Conversations to share that with us this evening. I can see there's loads of exciting questions to deal with. Um, but before we tackle those, just to let everyone know, next week we will have Duncan Butchart in the house. And uh, we are really, really excited to hear him talk about the garden birds and how to make your gardens a biodiversity island um, in this network of particularly urban spaces. So, yeah, please do tune in. Unfortunately, this is my final evening on Conservation Conversations for 2020. Uh, we will be having a new host on the show. Uh, CEO Mark Anderson is going to be stepping in for Andrew and I, who are both unfortunately taking some much needed bush time. But uh, Mark and Duncan are going to put on quite a show. So be sure to tune in. And we'll also be announcing all of those amazing prize winners. So be sure to tune in for that next week. Now, uh, Kaz, I'm going to kick us off with a question. I'm just going to ask you to sit forward a bit so that we're both on the camera. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's have a look here. We've got some questions from Llewellyn Taylor. So Llewellyn's asking, to what extent do you focus on corridors of connectivity? And hence, other than, sorry, other than other advantages, the mitigation against ecological fragmentation in an urban, urban environment like Johannesburg? So we really only looked at wetlands in this case. Um, we did sort of check out the effect of, of natural land cover um, or, or sort of, um, yeah, natural land cover as well. But the, yeah, the, the problem is it's sort of hard to figure out what exactly a, a corridor would really look like in, for birds in a, in a city like Johannesburg, um, just because all that suburban land cover that is, you know, very treed and, still quite lush it's sort of hard to figure out exactly what uh, yeah what what a corridor would look like awesome thanks Kaz 
Um, we've got a question here from Ronnie. Caroline mentioned that um, Johannesburg is the second largest city in the world, not on a major water body. And I see someone did actually type the answer in there, but just for everyone who hasn't actually gone on and read that, Kaz, would you mind telling us what the largest city in the world is that isn't built on a, a river or a lake, please? So it's Mexico City is the largest city, but it's actually a bit of a cheat because historically there used to be an absolutely massive, <laughs> massive lake there that uh, has been drained. Fantastic. All right. Um, so we've got a question here from Robert Smith asking, did you take river courses into account? So, for example, the Bramfontein Sprait or the Sand Sprait, which are also corridors for species movement. And I think some of the parts you did actually touch on are part of those those river courses. And would you mind just elaborating on some of these river corridors, Kaz? So that is what our wetland, so wetland is maybe not the perfect word for it, um, but any of the, any, any sort of water courses, that's how we took that into account. Um, and it certainly is important in terms of species movement. And I see we've got a question here from Janet Bloom, and she's asking, how did the hardy dar not feature in the top five? And is that because they're all living in my garden? Janet, I feel your pain. I've got a pair living in the tree outside our house. And at four in the morning, they uh, done us with their beautiful vuvuzela calls. And as the sun is setting in the afternoon, we get another rendition. Um, I suppose, Kaz, you might want to speak to the, the time of year that you happen to be doing your sampling in, and uh, maybe that has something to do with how noisy our springtime hardy does are versus your summertime counts. So they, they were, I think, in our top 10, just not in our top five. Um, and I think that has to do with in the more natural parks, uh, you know, places like uh, Ritfontein Nature Reserve or, or Lynx, Linksfield, excuse me, they uh, they just aren't that keen on those habitats, and so it sort of uh, uh, reduced how common they were. Awesome. Um, Penny Abbott's got a good question here, and Penny's one of our regular subscribers and always has excellent questions. So Penny's asking, is biodiversity in and of itself the goal? Somewhere like Johannesburg, which was transformed from the habitats that were originally there, might not reflect the normal biodiversity. So is this a good thing or not? Would you like to elaborate a bit on that, please? So the truth is that actually in terms of at least uh, species, you know, functional diversity, um, cities actually across the world are remarkably similar to, to more natural ecosystems. Um, because they, things will come and sort of fill in those niches. But I think where biodiversity is really important is more from the benefit that it has on human beings um, in terms of, um, in terms of you know, getting, getting people more interested in the natural world, as well as you know, the psychological benefits that it has for human beings. So we know that parks that have uh, more diversity um, that have more more bird diversity and more bird song are more appealing to people than and and more relaxing than those that don't, for instance. And we've got a, a question here from Anonymous asking um, if you considered indigenous trees and shrubs as an environmental factor in terms of your sort of vegetative analyses. I know you had so, some tree factors in your models. Can you just elaborate on us as to what exactly you were looking for in your, your veg components of your analyses, please? So because we're looking at quite a large scale uh, for this particular one, we, we can't really tell what's indigenous and what's not. Um, but sort of in our, in our next step of this program, uh, which has been uh, COVID limited so far, um, we have to go back to, um, we have to go back and resample our, and, and sample the vegetation at the points themselves. Um, so we were really interested in the landscape level, um, but we will be looking at a more local scale level and how, um, yeah, what the vegetation structure looks like, what trees are there, et cetera. Awesome, thanks. We've got a, a question here from Ted asking, 
Is there a link between the amount of pollution in the wetlands and diversity? Now, Ted, before Caroline answers that, I'm actually quite excited because I've just been working on our schedule for next year's conservation conversations. And on World Wetlands Day, which happens to be a Tuesday on the 2nd of February, we're going to be having representatives from Randwater and Johannesburg City Parks talking about the wetlands in Johannesburg. So they'll hopefully elaborate a little bit more on this. Um, but Caroline, did you actually factor in some of the, the sort of pollution angle and wetland health when you were looking at your wetland connectivity? So we haven't actually looked at that. Um, there's just, yeah, there's just no way from a, from a landscape perspective of really, really assessing that. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure it does affect which birds are there, but um, at least in terms of our, um, yeah, at least in terms of particularly fish eating type species. Fantastic. I'll watch the space. Hopefully we can get a bit more analyses into that going forward. Um, Ronnie's got a question. You said that Johannesburg is high at over 5% natural areas. Do you have figures for other South African cities like Durban or Cape Town? And do you happen to know what the world average might be for, for those areas? So it's not actually 5% natural areas. It's 5% of land is owned by city parks, um, just city parks alone. So uh, the number is probably much higher and it also depends on what you want to consider a natural area. Um, you know, yeah, not everything that city parks owns, you know, it also includes a lot of cemeteries. It includes a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, because actually the city of Johannesburg is probably well over, is well over 5% natural habitat in total. Um, but I don't know the exact number. Um, I think there are plans to keep working on this in Cape Town and Durban in the future. So maybe I'll be able to let you know at some point. Definitely. Sure, we're getting lots of lots of really good questions coming through here tonight. And um, we've got one from Michael Rampedi, and he's asking, how can the edge effect be factored into the analyses on your data in terms of the positive effect of habitat diversity? Would you like to elaborate on that a little bit, please? So, at a landscape, at a you know, sort of at a landscape uh, scale, we you know, we didn't look at sort of total. Well, I didn't look at total sort of uh, total habitat diversity. Um, we did. Uh, one of the honor students did work on that. Um, but yeah, actually, I think I think in some ways the edges here are actually kind of beloved by a lot of species. Um, you know, things like prinias and such really, really actually quite enjoy that. Um, but there are measures that you can use to to look at that. Um, there, there are a million connectivity and and uh, habitat fragmentation indices. We just chose some of the ones that uh, felt more appropriate. Frozen for a moment, but uh, hopefully you can all still hear us. And if you can't, uh, we'll be back in a second. But um, while we're waiting for, for the computer just to come back online, um, we'll carry on asking some questions. Um, we've got a question here from Dr. Llewellyn Taylor asking whether you've considered determining the eco status of these. Here we go. I think we're back. All right. Sorry for that, everybody. We seem to have had a, a momentary technical glitch. But uh, have you considered determining the eco status of these areas as part of the assessment, um, particularly when you're looking at riverine or riparian or wetlands? So we really just did did birds for now. Um, I would love to do other taxa and do a better um, sort of assessment of whether this holds true across um, across uh, you know butterflies, dragonflies, etc. Um, plants in particular. Um, hopefully in the future. Fantastic. Okay, I think I figured out where our technical glitches are coming in, so hopefully that won't happen again. Um, I suppose while we while we are waiting for this computer to sort itself out, Kaz, what was your favorite park that you you surveyed, and what was it about that park that w was your absolute favorite? I got to come with you on a couple, and I certainly loved venturing up into Linksfield Ridge, which is an area I've long lived around but very seldom been onto. So, what were some of your favorite parks? Ooh, that's hard. Um, you know, of course, I I particularly love you know my own home park, uh, which is Delta. 
uh, Delta Park in sort of more central Johannesburg. Um, it just always is such a joy to be there. Um, I love the bee eater roost there, um, the beautiful wetlands. Um, also, I, I absolutely loved, um, I think Ritfontein Ridge is a super beautiful park as well up in the Four Ways area. If you want a really beautiful natural ridge, uh, natural ridgy area to go for a nice couple kilometer walk um, and do some great birding. We got all sorts of beautiful sort of savanna type species there, blue waxbill, um, uh, indigo birds, uh, tons of canaries. Um, I really do love that. I really do love it there as well. Um, yeah, and blue bird sanctuary is another one that I think particularly if you're if you're a new birder is is particularly spectacular. Um, yards and a nice safe walk. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing that. And I'm sure you've opened up a lot of people's eyes to where they can go and uh, enjoy some good bird diversity, maybe areas they hadn't thought about going to before. Um, we've got a question here from Janet Bloom asking if City of Johannesburg has A, seen your study, and if you've had much engagement with them regarding some of the results of your work or not yet. So not yet. It is sort of part of our plan in the in the long run um, to work a little bit more with city parks. Um, and once our sort of first paper is published, I, I will probably send it on to some of the people who I have chatted to at at uh, Joburg City Parks. Fantastic. And then we've got a comment here from Sarah Charlton saying, as someone teaching an urban planning department, I'm really interested in your bird diversity, wetland, low income connection. She finds this simply fascinating. And I have to agree. I think um, having those wetlands is, is such a crucial part of not just um, access to biodiversity, but human survival and life survival in general. Without our wetland systems, we were doomed. So I think it's it's great that that message is coming through in your findings. And from a bird life conservation point of view, we've been drumming the conserve wetland drum as is all of our um, conservation partners around South Africa. So yet again, another um, bit of ammunition in our, our wetland conservation gun. So thank you for that. And uh, yeah, long may we conserve these amazing green spaces. Um, we are running into a bit of an issue in terms of accessing these questions and I'm hesitant to move this thing because every time I do our cameras going off. Um, so apologies everyone. Um, but I think in, it's been a really fascinating outlook to see just how these urban spaces can really um, be influenced by the, the available green space, not just for people to access, but obviously our birds. And I found it fascinating that your your bigger areas that surrounded the park that were more natural didn't influence more biodiversity. Do you want to unpack that a little bit more for us, please? <laughs> yeah, I think it's really interesting. Um, but I, yeah, I do think it just has to do with, you know, Grasslands are amazing systems, and I, as somebody who grew up in the forest, have an absolute obsession with grasslands. Um, but they they aren't high diversity systems, but they're high they they're very special. But they do hold a lot of very special birds, and I think there's a very high chance that those types of birds just are not keen in moving into moving into our our parks. Um, it's just not not their habitat in a lot of cases. Um, as well as, you know, too much of, you know, yeah, a lot of, a lot of the, the sort of urban forest of Johannesburg also supports a huge number of species and is, um, at least from a, from a total species richness point of view, is really, really important. Fantastic. And uh, I see we've got a question here from Eagle Eyed Eleanor Mary Cattle, who is also one of our good viewers. Um, and she's saying, what about the diversity in parks such as Delta or Walter Sisulu Gardens? Can you can you elaborate as to why you didn't choose Walter Sisulu and talk a little bit about Delta, please? Yeah, so Delta, Delta, you know, we always have this idea that Delta is, is this super diverse park. And I think in a lot of ways it is. Um, but it's sort of middle of the pack, actually, interestingly, from our, our data. Um, and I think, you know, I think part of the reason that we have an idea that it's, um, that it is so diverse is because we, we sample it so heavily um, as birders. Um, you know, lots and lots of birders come here, and so we do pick up a lot of stuff. But when you actually standardize the, the counting, um, it doesn't, it's not quite as diverse as as you'd initially think would be my guess. Um, yeah, in terms of Walter Sisulu, I did actually sample Walter Sisulu, but we ended up having to um, 
remove remove the two largest parks um, because they just were such hectic, absolutely hectic outliers in terms of what was going on. Um, they just didn't really accurately reflect um, reflect uh, what was going on. Walter Sisulu is immensely diverse. I mean, uh, yeah, uh, you can't believe the types of species you find there. Um, you yeah, know, and gray wagtails. <laughs> gray wagtails, yes, and uh, avamba sparrowhawks and tinkerbirds and yeah, I I mean it is one of my favorite places to bird. Um, the other reason we sort of left Walter Sisulu out is we were really trying to choose free free spaces, um, which Walter Sisulu is not. Fair enough. Well, I think you did an excellent job of uh, separating out a really nice mix of urban urban green spaces across Johannesburg. I think we have unfortunately run out of time and given that these uh, questions seem to be knocking out my video, um, I think we're going to leave it there tonight, Caroline. Thank you so, so much for joining us this evening. Um, we really, I certainly learned a lot and it's been so fun seeing you process this data and, and talk through it over the last couple of months. Um, a huge congratulations to you and Shiv. I'm really looking forward to seeing the scientific publications coming out of the study and thank you for breaking it down so eloquently for our viewers this evening. I think you've done a superb job of sharing your science in a really accessible way. So well done to you and a big thank you for coming on to Conservation Conversations. I don't know if you'd like to say any closing words before I let you go. All good. Well thank you. <laughs> thank you everyone for listening from me. A huge thank you to all of you. Conservation Conversations has been an amazing journey this year. I've loved putting all of these webinars together for you with Andrew and the rest of the team. A big thank you to Janine, Carl, Mark, and everyone else who's been involved in helping bring you all of these productions this year. Mark will be with you one more time next week for our final 2020 Conservation Conversations. And I'm excited to let you all know that as of 19 January, we will be back on your screens in 2021 bringing you weekly webinars for a couple more months. And uh, we're really looking forward to a new lineup of exciting speakers. Just watch our social media feeds, our websites. We'll have all of that information up for you shortly. Thank you all so much for your support. Thanks for watching. Keep your eyes on the skies. Keep enjoying those birds. And I'll be back with you in 2021. And Mark will see you all next week, same time, same place, on Conservation Conversations. Good night, everybody. Thanks for watching.